13 years old, I was a big fan of the X-Files. I'd sneak out of bed to watch it late at night, swaddled in darkness, and scare myself as aliens and other spooks bedeviled Mulder and Scully. So of course, when a mate of mine got the PC game featuring live action footage, which essentially allowed you to play an episode of the show, I was all over that. I loved it so much that when I borrowed it, thinking myself clever, I chose the discless installation option. That way, I could have the game on my dad's computer forever, even after giving it back to my mate. My plan was foiled by the game taking up every last bit of space on the PC, meaning nothing else worked as it should have, and necessitating it being uninstalled. What was I thinking? Discless installation was three whole megabytes. Hi, I'm Phil, and you're watching Uncapped Gaming. In 1998, The X-Files was at the height of its popularity. That summer saw the release of the feature film Fight the Future, which occurred between the show's 5th and 6th season, both in the real world and in the series continuity. With Mulder and Scully household names and the film making in $189 million at the box office after what would be not only the highest rated season of the show to air, but the highest rated Fox programme that year, it was the ideal time for the franchise to spread into other media. Into the simply titled The X-Files Game, which released on PC that year and PlayStation 1 a year later. Whilst lots of films, television shows and even soft drinks have been adapted into video games, one thing that can definitely be said for this game is it wasn't a simple cash grab. When it came out, this game was a beast. It comes with seven, yes, seven CD-ROMs worth of gameplay, and even if the 640x480 resolution footage seems quaint and small today, you can see why. The game is a point-and-click adventure which uses full motion video rather than computer graphics for both the cutscenes and the gameplay, and it was a project that the makers of the show very much took ownership of. Chris Carter and Frank Spotnitz wrote the story, and along with Richard Dowdy developed the screenplay. The design document for the game was over a thousand pages, and the shooting script was 748 pages, putting it in the same league as the likes of Detroit Become Human in terms of the amount of writing involved. The footage for the game totals about six hours, featuring not only a number of high-profile series regulars reprising their roles, but also on-location filming, all designed to make you feel like you're playing an episode of the show. You can hear the efforts of the CD drive as it exerts itself to deliver all of this to you in not quite real time. The question is, did it work? At the time it came out, I certainly thought so. I loved that game. I played through it multiple times, and it stuck in my imagination. Today, we're going to compare nostalgia to reality and see whether the X-Files game holds up in 2021. I want to believe. Spoilers follow, if you've not played the game. As you load up disc 1, you're greeted with the sight of a rat burning its nose on a lit cigarette. The shot pans out to a dockside warehouse, where Mulder and Scully pick a lock in order to look at some mysterious black powder on the floor. Whatever this may be, the investigation is rudely interrupted by three gunmen, forcing the agents to take cover. But a bright flash of light makes the gunmen cry out and we see Mulder's shock just before the show's title sequence plays. All of which was enough to hook 13 year old me right in and it's still cool to this day. Once we start the game properly, we take on the identity of Seattle based Agent Wilmore, who finds out from his partner Agent Cook that there's a big wig in the field office from DC. Here you can choose to respond seriously, jokingly or paranoid and this will affect certain things through the rest of the game, as will a couple of the other dialogue decisions you take. Either way, you settle down at your desk and quickly receive a call to attend the office of your boss, Armistead Shanks. Whether he has a brother called Armitage who installs toilets is never established in canon, but I want to say yes. Shanks introduces you to Assistant Director Skinner, and you find out that you're going to be helping him search for Mulder and Scully, who are missing. Handing off your cases to Cook, whose helpfulness fears between friendly, occasionally flirty, and sort of sinister. Great. Thanks, Golden Boy. You head out to the motel the agent stayed at. Scully's laptop is still there, and the phone records lead you to the dockside warehouse that we saw in the opening scene. At the warehouse, you find a bullet lodged in a post, a pool of blood underneath, a stub of a Morley cigarette, and wooden boxes full of black powder. You also speak to a fisherman named Wong. He tells you the fishing has been drying up, but he otherwise doesn't know anything. Before you can leave, you see a black sedan following you and take a photo of its license plate. The evidence you collect goes to the crime lab, 
where your lab tech buddy Amis tells you the powder is industrial grade lead after you ask after each other's ex-wives. Which might have been normal guy talk in the 90s, I don't know. It's neither illegal nor sexy. Back to the field office. The computer search tells you that Wong has a criminal record and that the sedan is probably government as a license plate search comes up classified. Skinner then asks you to stake out the warehouse overnight before he heads back to DC because the time he had to spare to film footage for a video game is up. The warehouse stakeout gives us our first real sense of the stakes in the game. As two men in a sedan show up and revealing yourself to them by clicking forward too eagerly or going in the front entrance means we abruptly cut to Wilmore's body being dragged out of the water. Avoiding that fate, you go around to the side entrance and lockpick your way inside. Watching the men remove something from under the floor and carry it away. After which you can report back to Skinner and Shanks via your trusty PDA before heading home to get some sleep. The next morning at the field office you find Cook lying unconscious on the floor and Scully's laptop missing from the evidence locker. To make matters worse you find out that Wong is dead. Although you also wonder how Cook knows about Wong because you didn't tell him. His answers seem evasive but he's TV shifty so it's, although it's plain for the player to see, Wilmore thinks no more of it. I didn't tell you about Wong. Oh. Well, I guess Skinner must have mentioned it. At the docks, you find Wong's body and a Molly cigarette butt near it. He was shot in the back of the head with no resistance, either taken unawares or knowing his killer beforehand. You also meet Detective Astadorian of Seattle PD, who is, amongst other things, a woman. You know this not only because of your astute FBIing skills, but because there's an extra dialogue option to say that the colour she's wearing looks lovely. Presumably she spent a bit of extra time at Lady Trenchcoat, making sure everything was properly coordinated. Excuse me? Mommy? Sorry. Mommy? Sorry. Mommy? Sorry. Mommy? Sorry. Mommy? Thank you. Uh, let's just stick to business, alright? After Dorian takes you down to Wong's boat, where you find a big stash of illegal pills and a slicker bearing the name Tarakan. The latter, the harbour master turns up to inform you, is a Russian vessel at Ben with the crew on board, and as such is your next destination. The boat has the shadows of the dead crew scorched into the hull, and on board you find fingerprints belonging to Cook, logbooks, a strange logo, and a big metal ball. Look at this. What is it? I have no idea. We'll be careful with it. The books go for translation and the ball goes to the crime lab, whilst you and the detective head to the coroner's office. Here, if you look at Wong's body, his face twitches. Fun times. You find out that Wong had at least three cans of cancer and was probably taking the drugs to relieve the pain. Coroner also reveals that Mulder and Scully came by asking about the Tarakan crew who Scully wanted to autopsy again. The bodies are now missing. After Dorian surmises that this is all the product of a uranium smuggling ring out of the former Soviet Union and decides that she's now your partner. Returning to your apartment, a slightly manic cook arrives and demands to know why you've left him out the loop on the case. After a less than convincing explanation of why his fingerprints were on the Tarakan, he spins a tale of a smuggling operation involving FBI corruption and claims he is being targeted. After this, you once more stake out the warehouse and this time, if you avoid being shot, find a crumpled piece of paper in a truck. The next day at noon, Astadorian wakes you up to show you a videotape of a man who looks like Mulder erupting with white light when confronted by a trucker. You find out from the coroner that the trucker's radiation burns would have to have come from a blast. After the coroner's, the next stop is the trucking company, only for it to blow up after an encounter with a man with black oil in his eyes. The next day, Hook all but drags you along to the most hastily arranged raid in the history of the FBI. Back up and the local police have been called, he insists, yet strangely it ends up with just the two of you shooting a bunch of Georgian smugglers and arresting their leader. Hook has conveniently found a gun which matches the ballistics of the bullet that hit Scully and killed Wong, allowing you to make him an arrest. In the meantime, the crime lab has determined that the metal ball you found stored radioactive materials, and Amos is unsurprisingly mad at you for giving him radiation poisoning. Astadorian is equally mad, because to nobody's surprise, Hook didn't actually inform her of the raid. She was just starting to like you too. The row, which disappointingly lacks either character cottoning on the Hook is a bit sus, is interrupted with a call from a mysterious informant offering you information if you come to an airport, ha airport hangar alone at dawn. Your informant is X, who tells you where Scully is and gives you the series patented alien neck stabby tool. But he manages to miss that Astadorian heard the whole thing and has apparently forgiven you, 
ready to dive deeper into the intrigue with you. Scully is recovering in hospital from a gunshot wound and possible radiation poisoning, but after seeing the alien next stabber, opens up that Mulder thinks the crew of the Tarakan were nuclear blasted into oblivion by aliens. I think it's great to hear of a detective who's a creative thinker. Next stop on the conspiracy tour is a rail yard, where a bear out train car holds evidence of medical experiments, and a homeless man gives you a videotape. Videotape? But only after making you guess that the thing he wants to give you is a videotape. Congratulations, that was fun. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. The tape reveals to you, after Dorian and Cook, because apparently still nobody suspects Cook, the identity of a military surgeon based in Alaska. This then leads to a video call from the lone gunman with a connection and quality that Zoom calls 23 years later can't always boast. And I believe you have a filter. Where they disclose the coordinates of a secret military base, also in Alaska. And now we're racing towards the climax. You find Mulder in the surgeon's house, tied up, and after releasing him, you have to evade the murderous intentions of two NSA agents. Having escaped, you meet Scully in the secret base where lots of the occupants are turning up dead. Mulder is infected with the black oil, and you have to work with Scully to trap him. Hook is also there, revealing his role in the conspiracy, and you survive either by shooting him or by cattle prodding him. If it's the latter, he turns up again at the end so that the black oil can jump to him from Mulder and Scully can duly give him a surgical neck stabbing. Otherwise, the oil jumps to you and you meet the same fate. Assuming that it's Cook who takes on the black oil, you get commended for your efforts back in Seattle. Oh, Detective Estadorian also mentioned she had some paperwork for you to sign. She said she'd drop it by your place, although I told her she could send it here. She seemed uh, adamant about handing it off to you directly. Blow, chicka, blow, blow. Before a final ominous meeting with X suggesting you might need to use the next stabber again soon. As far as X-Files plots go, all of this is standard fare, but it's well executed. The story being written by the series creator gives it a real sense of being anchored to the official canon, whilst the performances on the whole are effective. There are a few moments that feel stiffer than they ought to, particularly depending on what order you run through certain dialogue choices. However, given the time the game came out, and the nature of the narrative, this does to an extent seem unavoidable. The cheesiness with which some of the lines are delivered is pure X-Files, whilst there is the level of serious attention to detail put into the game over screens. Wilmore's wet corpse can get pulled out of the dock, but equally you can see him riddled with bullets in several separate cutscenes, or face at least two versions of him being asked to hand in his badge, or see him lined up for a post-arrest mugshot. There's even an alternate ending where Wilmore kills alien possessed Mulder and Scully is left to mourn. This in particular wasn't necessary, and the player could have been presented with a game over screen, but it shows how seriously they took the game. The gameplay is simple point and click style, which broadly works for the nature of the story and its execution, but also presents a number of frustrations. There isn't an in-game tutorial or any kind of button prompt for the actions you must perform, and so even at the very start it's easy to get lost. The very first puzzle of the game makes you solve is your own password for the computer, which is a random word on your notice board on which I had to find a walkthrough to solve the first time. After typing in the names of Wilmore's ex wife and daughter, a feeling like I wanted to grow my hair just so I could pull it out. If you play this game, it's recommended to read the manual and explore fully. Otherwise, you don't pick up all your equipment in the field office, and you don't know that you need to, for example, use your evidence kit to pick up bullets and blood. There are also a couple of situations where you need to find an object on location. Throw bar at the warehouse to open the boxes filled with lead, which you can only find by using your flashlight to go upstairs, and a shovel at the trucking office which you need to smash a vent open so you can escape. There are no prompts for these things, leaving trial and error, or being lost and frustrated for hours before finding a walkthrough, as the only way to make progress. Navigation is in theory straightforward, though not always so in practice. In some parts of the game where you stand, you can go forward or turn left or right, whilst in others turning left or right takes you 180 degrees rather than 90. Some rooms look different depending on which door you come in from, and this can affect which part of the rooms you can navigate to despite the room being small and square. This doesn't hugely hinder the game, until you have to find items in the location. In the warehouse I spent a good hour wandering back and forth, unable to find a cigarette stub, which brought back memories of the same struggle as a teenager. On the tarot count, I felt like I was clicking wildly in every direction on every floor before I found everything. The game is built in a way that certain story events don't trigger until you've exhausted all of the dialogue options, which in turn are only all available if you find every relevant object in the location. Whilst this may be useful in avoiding future frustration by minimising the need to backtrack, 
it trades this off with a more immediate frustration when it feels as though you've done everything, and yet you remain at an impasse, unable to move forward. It also resulted in Aston Dorian sternly warning me to Get your hand off my ass. After I overzealously clicked the screen, hoping to force the game to move on. On the other hand, the game becomes extremely fast-paced, both in the raid with Cook and the Alaskan base. In both cases, you find yourself confronted with enemies and needing to shoot first. Aiming isn't difficult, but if you weren't prepared for it and didn't select your gun, it's an automatic death. Sometimes this resulted in a retry prompt, which allowed you to go back and retry that specific part. However, other deaths appeared to just result in a game over, which throw you back to your last manual save, and I couldn't see a logic behind which was which. The Alaska base also felt like you oscillated between needing to make the right choices and random choice. Even knowing what to do, it was still too easy to get lost because of how the navigation worked and inadvertently trigger a game ending action such as a soldier popping up from nowhere and shooting you or Scully being infected with the black oil and killing you. Getting lost also allowed me to trigger events that felt out of sequence or random even when I was on the right story path, which was slightly immersion breaking. Despite all this, I still thoroughly enjoyed playing the game and really wanted to relive it and see how it ended. Though I do wonder how much that was me being driven forward by my own nostalgia and whether these issues will be a more permanent roadblock for players coming at the game entirely fresh. When I was 13, I played through the game multiple times. At one point, I recall having played it enough to be able to effectively speedrun it by making all the correct choices near instantly from memory. At 36, I played through at least some of the sections of the game multiple times, though this wasn't by choice. One of my recordings didn't quite work, necessitating a replay, and when I was on disc 4, a missed time freeze after being too cavalier about manual saves threw me all the way back to disc 2. Both were my own fault, but nevertheless frustrating. I suspect I will play the game again, however it will be with some distance between this playthrough and then, rather than immediately leaping back in as I have with games such as Sonic the Hedgehog, or Resident Evil, or The Last of Us. All told, I'm glad that I bought the game and gave it another go. There are a few obvious technical issues playing a game built for Windows 98 on Windows 10. After several hours of frustration and multiple failed installs, I realised that I needed to install QuickTime and DirectX before I installed the game for it to work. However, beyond that hurdle, the only real issue was the need to make sure the discs were clean and remember that the game came out before autosaves. The lower resolution isn't so bad as to make it unplayable, hunting for a cigarette in a warehouse aside. And except when the discs struggle to make the FMV play without stuttering, it looked good. The main setback with the mechanics is the lack of in-game tutorial alongside how rigid the progression requirements can be versus how unforgiving fail states are more often than not. This may be off-putting for players used to newer games, but if you can get past this and make sure to save your game zealously, then I suspect you'll enjoy it, especially if you're an X-File. The truth is out there. Thanks for watching Uncap Gaming. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more content. See you next time.